Shall we open our Bibles up to the Gospel of Matthew? We're in chapter 22. We're getting close to the end here. Where shall we go next? (laughs) I already have a plan. All right. So, yes, we are in chapter 22. Now, as I've mentioned to you each week here that... uh, We're dealing with the very last week of Jesus' life. We've seen quite a few events take place. We've seen him anger the powers that be, if you will. We've seen them plotting to silence him, even to the point of killing him. So these plans are being made behind the scenes concerning him. But you know, there's a passage in the Scripture that tells us at a certain point, Jesus put his attention and his gaze upon Jerusalem. And that was when he turned and went there for the last time, which is what we're looking at here, before he was offered up as a sin offering for you and me. I cannot imagine the human factor here going on with the Lord knowing that he only has a few days. I know for sure that the Bible teaches us that he was a man, but yet he was God. He had all of the emotions of a person. He wasn't like some kind of a robot. He loved people. And I know that when he saw people suffering, we've seen so many times where it said he had compassion on them. To me, that's a beautiful thing this morning because he has compassion on us too. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, the Lord has compassion on us. You know, the Bible tells us that he, he knows us. He knows our frame And interestingly enough, it says, he remembers that we're just dust. That's truly what we are in the end. But he has put a spirit within us, an eternal spirit that lives on when we leave these beautiful bodies that we're in, right? But that we have a new home. We have an inheritance. We have an eternal inheritance with him. And so this morning, this is a a section of Scripture where the leaders, if you will, are attempting in several different ways uh, to trap Jesus. They want to catch him in some kind of a statement in which they can blow it up and discredit him and even accuse him. And so in their great wisdom... They come to the Lord. Uh, Who on earth would think that you could come to Jesus and outsmart him? Or trap him, for that matter. Or win a debate with him, right? It's just not going to happen. But yet, over and over and over, we've seen this attempted in our Gospel of Matthew. And over and over and over again, he makes them look like fools. And that doesn't change a whole lot Uh, as we go through. So let's look at uh, verse 15 here. We'll read on down through a bit. It says, uh, Then the Pharisees went, and they plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, And you teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. So tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, he perceived their wickedness, and he said to them, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. And so they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is on this? They said, Caesar's. 
He said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. On the same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, that his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there was with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second and the third, even to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven (laughs) will she be? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and he said to them, You're mistaken, not knowing the scripture or the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. We'll stop right there for a piece and see if we can get, get all this covered this morning. So again, over and over again, these Pharisees now, they're making plans. They're wanting to entangle him. Um, I've talked to you a little bit here about these Pharisees. So there's really three main players or ideologies, if you will, uh, during this time of Jesus' life. We have the Pharisees, and we have the Sadducees, and we have the Herodians. And all three of these groups are at odds with one another. The Pharisees, if you will, they're a group of people who are very uh, consumed with the law and um, pious living, not violating any of the diets and the things that they believe that they needed to adhere to, but what happened with the... And all this, a lot of times when we see the word Pharisees, we see the word scribes next to it, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the ones that interpreted the law. So they interpreted the law, and the Pharisees, they upheld it. So what happens over many years, hundreds and hundreds of years, is these traditions get passed down orally and sometimes written, and these traditions really have nothing to do with the law. They're added. And you know there's a lot of things today that we can look around at different churches, and we can see traditions that they do, practices that they do, and it's not found in the Bible. And so you kind of wonder, where does that come from? We're praying to saints, and we're doing this, and we're doing that. Where is that in Scripture? It's not there. How did it get there then? It was handed down, much like with the Pharisees and the scribes over the years. They were the ones who interpreted the law. They're the ones that said, when the Bible says, do no labor on the Sabbath, well, they're the ones that picked it apart and said, these are the fine prints of that command. You can't carry a burden. That means if you have a peg leg, you can't put it on that day because you're carrying a burden. If you have false teeth, you can't wear them because you're carrying a burden. See how ridiculous it gets when you allow man, the human factor, to get into God's law? He never intended for that to happen when he gave the law. The law was given for our good, to protect us against our own selves, actually. But the scribes and the Pharisees over the years had brought in all of these traditions, and they would weigh them heavily upon the people, especially the ones concerning tithing and concerning dietary laws. They were very, very astute because of the scribes who interpreted the law for them. But truly, when you think about it, the law of Moses is found in the first five books of the Bible. 
It's called the Pentateuch. That's the five books that the Jews built upon for their religion, how they would live. But yet the scribes and the Pharisees interpreted it for their own special thinking, depending on the times. How many of you know this morning that God does not change? When he says something, he means it forever, right? When he says, thou shalt not, there's not a time in history when he says, well, it's kind of up to you, right? It doesn't change. It doesn't change with the times. It doesn't change with different fads that might be going through society. God's law is firm. Thank you, God, that it doesn't change because everything else is in flux. Everything else is subject to change, everything except God. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I change not. I love that, don't you? Don't you love it in a world where everything is kind of could be shaky, but here we have something that we can latch on to, something that we can hold on to in our lives, and we can know this will never, ever change. He will, when he said, I will never leave you or forsake you, that never changes. No matter what your end of the deal might be, what's going on on your end, you might not be doing so well. You might be out there kind of, well, let's just say a flaky believer maybe, halfway, compromised, whatever. But that does not change his affection towards you and me. Because we all come short, don't we? We all miss the mark. We all trip. And sometimes... Shameless to say, sometimes we do it purposely, knowing that we're doing something we shouldn't be doing, but we do it nevertheless. So does that mean Jesus is saying, okay, that's your 752nd chance, you are out of here? Never. Because he said in his word, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. But you know what, I'm a child of God, you're a child of God, and a good parent disciplines his children. Have you ever been spanked by the Lord? He's got a big hand. Pastor Chuck used to say, you know, God's hand can span the width of the universe, and sometimes it spans my backside too. Because he loves us. He disciplines us. And even when we're found in a place in our lives where we're not walking the way we should, It doesn't mean he abandons us, but for sure it means he's not done with us, and for sure it means that he will not let us go. He paid too big of a price. God paid the ultimate price for you and me to be sitting here this morning together. He gave his only son. He gave his only son to be a sin offering for me and you. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's totally humbling to me. To know that the Lord would love me that much that he would take my place on that method of execution we have hanging on the wall there. So these Pharisees were really, really uh, pious experts, if you will, in the law. And you know, you meet people like that today, too who are very legalistic in their lives, and they think that they're experts in the law, and they're going to tell you exactly how you need to live your life, right? And if you come short of that, then you're not in the club anymore. And uh, we saw that happen so many times with these Pharisees. They were so uh, picky about things that they wouldn't even eat with the general public. The Jews. They put them, separated themselves from the Jews because they didn't know if the person they're eating with had washed their hands properly. They didn't know if they had paid their tithes. So they didn't want to be associated with fallen people <laughs> as though they weren't themselves. But they were, just like you and just like me. And so the Pharisees, they found that uh, the public was not careful enough about the ritual laws that they had. So they come with the Herodians. Now, we're introduced to the second group of people, the Herodians. They were Jews that had huge influence 
on Israel and on the policies and the politics. And the Herodians were kind of the super, super liberal part of the Jews. They kind of accepted a lot of Greek customs into their ideology. They decided that it was easier to submit and compromise with the Romans than it was to fight back. So they tended to lean on that as far as um, protecting themselves. So they're pro-Roman sympathies, if you will. They were sympathizers. They allowed a lot of things into their lives as Herodians that weren't godly things. And then, of course, next we have our buddies, the, the Pharisees. Uh, I'm sorry, the Sadducees. Sadducees are an interesting group of people. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees were strict scriptural people to their benefit, to their praise, if you will. They only believed what was said in the first five books of the Bible. Nothing more, nothing less. If it's there, that's what we do. If it's not there, we don't do it. Much kind of like us today. If it's in God's Word, then we'll do it. If it's not, we're not going to do it. So you can see how the Sadducees were very, very opposed to the Pharisees who kind of made it up as they went. And then the Herodians were there and they were opposed to them because they were so liberal and so compromised. So you got three entities of power, political power, religious power, and they're all at each other's throats struggling for who's going to be in charge, but the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they all had the same enemy, and it was Jesus. And so they were willing to set their differences aside. They were willing to say, we need to unite and stop this man, because he's a threat to all of us, all three of our groups. And so that's why they come. They join forces with their political and religious enemies to show how much they actually hated Jesus. And so they send disciples of the Pharisees, students more or less, and the Herodians. Now what they say to him is interesting here as we begin to look at this. In verse uh, 16, it says, Teacher... We know that you are true, and you teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. This is how they approached him, with flattery. And you know, that's a lot of times how the enemy does approach us. He comes in with flattery. He comes in to try to get our focus off the main thing and onto something else. And you know what? Jesus responds to them by saying, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? What's a hypocrite? It's an imposter. A hypocrite is somebody playing a role that they really don't live. So we can do that in church every Sunday, can't we? We can march in here and be all Christianese and put on our little Jesus language and all that kind of stuff and, you know... And we can walk out and be a totally different person for the rest of the week. My favorite hypocrite of all is Jack Captain James T. Kirk. He's an actor. That's what a hypocrite is. It's an actor portraying a role. So as a matter of fact, in the Greek culture, when they would have these great plays and thousands of people would sit there and watch these plays, the actors in the play were called hypocrite, which meant an actor portraying a role. So you see what a hypocrite is. It's not a person who's struggling. It's somebody who willingly is deceiving. And what we see happening here in the beginning of our text is these men, these people, are coming to him trying to puff him up with compliments. And not only puff him up with compliments, but also speak of his authority and his power. So they were right in many regards. We know that you're true. 
That's true. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Everything he said is truth. His word is truth. And you teach the way of God in truth. That's true also. He taught from the scripture the ways of God. As a matter of fact, people marveled at his teachings. They were blown away by how he was able to expose the word of God to people on a level that they could absorb it and they could make it theirs and make it personal. He had that gift. And people, it tells us so many times, they were amazed or astonished at his teachings. Now we look at it this morning and we look at this and we go, what's so astonishing about that? It just makes sense, the things that he's saying, but you can see people who are spiritually blind, so many times they get so caught up in the little tiny minute details, they miss the whole purpose, right? So how important it was for them to come, first of all, and say, boy, we know you're mighty. We know that you don't care about anybody else. That's not true. We know that... um, You don't regard the person of men. That's not true. But what they're doing is they're trying to feed his pride, his ego. You are such a great, mighty man. No one can compare to you. They're relating him to some of the kings that they had dealt dealt with with in their world. Because kings didn't care about men. Kings didn't care about persons. But this king, he does. He's the king of kings. Amen? So he asked him, why are you testing me? What was the question? Well, it's a political question, actually. Is it okay to pay taxes? And, you know, we we complain about that all the time, and I I know that, and that's probably um, (laughs) justified sometimes. But think about these people. They work very, very hard. They're agricultural type people. They have livestock. They have farms. They grow stuff. They're not wealthy. They're not rich. And the Roman government came in and invaded their land. And the taxes that were levied upon them were really, really high. That's why they hated Matthew so much. Because you know what his job was? He was a tax collector. He was the IRS of his time, and they didn't like him. He was a traitor in their eyes. And not only that, then the Jewish group, they would also require these heavy tithes. So you're getting taxed twice, and you don't have a whole lot. So you're walking away with not much left. So the people there were like, we don't like paying taxes to Caesar. We don't like them being in our land. And so they're trying to trip Jesus. They're trying to trap him here with this question. Should we pay taxes? Now, I know that God's word tells us that we should obey the laws of the land. And you know what? It's hard for me, uh, particularly when I see the abuse and misuse of what we give them to work with. And it makes you almost want to say, I don't want to give them anymore because they don't use it right. They're liars and they're scammers and they've got their own agenda. And why should I give them my hard-earned money so they can continue to do that? Well, the Bible says we should. We should pay our taxes. They had to pay their taxes, no matter how high they might have been, and they did not like it at all. So Jesus asked them, show me a tax money. Show me the coin. The coin was a Roman coin. It wasn't a temple coin. And you remember when Jesus cleansed the temple that he went to the money exchangers where they would take Jewish money and they would exchange it for Roman money. Of course, at very high rip-off rates, too. Everything they did was to rip off the people. And so he asked for a coin, and, and he asked them, whose inscription is on the coin? And they said, it's Caesar's. It's Caesar's. And so 
He said, well, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, yeah, you should pay your tax. But give to God the things that are God's. Now, that's an important principle there, you guys. Because while we might grumble and complain or whatever about having to give like that, who's the true provider in our lives? Who's the one that provides for our needs? Who's the one that gives us the opportunities to earn a living in this culture? It's God. So I would almost, in my life, I would probably say, I would like to flip-flop this a little bit and just say, first and foremost, I want to give to God the things that are His. And by doing that, by giving God the things that are His, He's going to provide the, the, the opportunity, if you will, the means to do the other things, to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, look at their response in verse 22. When they heard these words, they marveled. Did you marvel when you heard those words today? I didn't. When I read them, I thought, well, that's just common sense. And that's good, solid Bible teaching right there. It's scriptural, what he's saying. It's really not marvelous. But to them who had been underneath this darkness all of their lives, underneath this authority pressing down on them all of their lives, they're hearing something that is so simplistic and so logical and so true It's blowing them away. You know what? That happens with people today, too. People get caught up in these different groups, and they are so caught up in the little things, they miss the whole point. And then suddenly someone comes along with some simple little statement to them that's not marvelous at all, but to them, it's eye-opening. And in their eyes, of course, it's like, wow. I never thought about it. I never saw that before. That's what the Holy Spirit does, you know. He opens our hearts. He opens our eyes to the things of God. And we always find that the things of God are not complicated. They're not complicated. If you have a complicated Christian walk and a complicated relationship with God, that wasn't His plan. Right? He told us to come as children. How can you complicate that? Right? Children don't complicate things. All they do is trust. You're going to take care of me. You're going to love me. You're going to provide for me. You're going to protect me. And so he gives them this response. Our next test, trap, if you will, is a doctrinal trap. Doctrine meaning what you believe, what you teach. Doctrine is the whole Bible. Some people say, oh, I don't like doctrine. Well, you have to like doctrine if you like the Word of God because doctrine is just what we believe. That's what it is. Now, that word has been taken and twisted and all that to make it seem like it's unpleasant. But this doctrine that they have, um, which we're going to look at here, is pretty interesting and unique in itself. We read the story. And keep in mind, if you'll look at verse 23, it was on the same day that the Sadducees came to him. They believe that there's no resurrection. Isn't that interesting? You know why they didn't believe in a resurrection? Because it's not taught in the first five books of the Bible. You don't read anything about the afterlife in the Pentateuch, you don't read anything about angels. You don't read any of that in there. And so these Sadducees, like I said earlier, who were sticklers to sticking to what those five books said, since it didn't include resurrection, they rejected the idea. As a matter of fact, they rejected the idea of eternal life, period. They believe you come through this earth, you make it what you make it, it's good, bad, or ugly, and when you die, you're dead. That's it. That's what they believed. I think a lot of people think that way today. What a sad way to believe, though, huh? God has so much more for us. This is just a tiny little preview of having a relationship with Him, of what's in store for us later, which is going to be 
in his presence. It's going to be phenomenal. That will be marvelous and amazing. So they give this example, which is absolutely ridiculous. Talk about a, a, hyper, a hyperbole. This is one if I'd ever seen one. They go to the most extreme they can go to try to trap the Lord. Um, so they said, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies and has no children, that his brother will marry his wife and raise offspring to them. And that's very true. That was in the law. That was in the law of Moses within the five books of the Pentateuch. And so they stood by it. And it was, as a, as your, as a brother to your sister-in-law, if your brother died, it was your obligation to marry her and to give her children so that his bloodline would continue on. Now today that would seem really outrageous, right? We think, are you kidding me? I don't want to marry her. I got my own wife. I got my own, I got all this, uh, you know, I, I don't have room for that in my life. But that was the law. But they're going to take this to the furthest extent they can when they say, well, the first guy, the first husband died and he didn't have any children. And so his wife went to his brother and they got married and then he died and didn't have any children. And they go all the way down this story until there's seven brothers who die without giving her any children. Now, I would think, actually, that maybe it was a problem she had after seven guys, right? Don't know. That's not Scripture. Uh -uh. So they, they, they give this example. So therefore, verse 28, here's the question. Here's the doctrinal question. In the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? Because they all had her. Now, wait a minute. First thing I would say, if I'm Jesus, I'm saying, what are you doing, you guys? You don't even believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in it. They believed in the here and the now, and when you're done, you're done. That's a really sad way to live, you know, when you, when you believe that way. That's why they were called sad, you see. <laughs> Corny, I know, I know. I always get told, try not to be a comedian up there. I can't help it sometimes. So the question is posed. Now, here's, here's Jesus' response. You are mistaken. That's the first three words he said. You're wrong. And why are you wrong? Because you don't know the scriptures. How is it that all these silly things get incorporated into the Christian faith that aren't even in the scripture? And people go along with it. Why do you do that? I don't know. We don't know. It's just always been done that way, so that's how we do it. Really. Evidently, you don't know the Scriptures. Otherwise, you would know whether or not it's appropriate or not appropriate. Whether it should be the law or if it's just a tradition. You're mistaken. First of all, you and I, this morning, what we're doing here... This is what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to study the Scripture. He wants you to know the Bible. Because if you don't know the Bible, then you can be subjected to anything out there with the title of Jesus on it. Believe me, there's a lot of Jesuses out there that aren't ours. They're not our Jesus. They're different. And if I don't know God's word, then how am I going to know the difference when those two young men knock on my door so nice and clean cut? And they have this great story to tell me, and I don't know the word at all, and they start telling me this big old fable, and I'm just sucked right into it, and next thing you know, I become part of their group because I don't know what God's word says. Oh, they'll use God's word, but they'll twist it, and they'll turn it, and they'll make it fit into their little situation that they're, that they're espousing to people. 
Here's the thing. No matter how you think or what you believe, you need to filter it through God's word. And what comes out the bottom will be truth. And what doesn't, we have to reject. It goes the other way so many times, though. People will take their ideas and their motives, and they will run God's word through those. Instead, it's doing it backwards. And what comes out is an opinion, a tradition, a new requirement. We have to be so careful, you guys, that we know what God's word has to say. Now, I want to read from Deuteronomy 25, and this is the, uh, the law that these uh, people are referring to here when they're trying to test Jesus. I'm going to read this out of the NIV because it, it's, it's kind of easier to digest. It says, if, a, if brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However... If a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, my husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. And then the elders of the town will summon him and talk to him. And if he persists in saying he does not want to marry her, then he, this, is, this is the weirdest thing. Then his brother's widow will go up to him in the presence of the elders and take off one of his sandals and spit in his face. And she will say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. And that man's line will be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Is that weird or what? I remember years ago, um, there was a, a news th on the news, and George Bush was over in the Middle East somewhere, and somebody in the crowd took off their sandal and threw it at him on the stage, and he had to dodge it, right? Same kind of principle, the unsandaled. What is that all about? That's pretty strange, isn't it? So... Um, Again, this is where you would take the law and take it to its extreme. But that's how it was supposed to happen. Spit in his face and take one of his sandals. Now he's going to walk around with one bare foot and one sandal, and everybody will know that he's the unsandaled guy. It was called the Leverite Law, and it meant the brother-in-law law, literally that the brother-in-law was to be uh, willing to take on this wife. And again, you know, the question is posed by these people who don't even believe in the resurrection. That's how blatant, how desperate they are when he said hypocrite, he meant it. Because they're playing the role of something that they're not. Just to try to trap him. And so Jesus gives them an answer. He said, you're mistaken not knowing the scripture. Or, here's the other part of that equation, the power of God. You don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. You don't believe in God's ultimate power. He is the most powerful being in the universe, the creator of all things. He's in control of everything. Now, you might be here this morning thinking, well, he's, uh, my life's out of control. I don't know what's going on. He's still in control of that. We're the ones that make it out of control, don't we? He never does that. He's always there waiting, beckoning to us. But concerning the resurrection, he said, first of all, you don't understand Scripture. You don't understand the spiritual element of God's power. Because in the resurrection, they're not marrying, and they're not giving in marriage, but they're like the angels of God in heaven. Now, i got to split a hair here for you. He's not saying that they're angels. Your dead grandma is not an angel in heaven. 
She's like the angels in that marriage is no longer needful. Why was marriage invented? Well, for two reasons. One, to keep the species going, right? Because we're dying. We all die. And if we want the human race to continue, we're going to get married and procreate and have kids. That's one purpose. The other purpose is that God wanted to show us our relationship with his son, who is our bridegroom, and we are the bride. And so marriage is a beautiful picture when it's functioning properly of the man taking the role of the Messiah in that relationship, the protector, the leader, the strength. And the bride, of course, is the one who is submitted to that, just like we're submitted to Christ. I know, ladies, you don't like that. Some of you are going, I ain't submitting to my husband. He's a jerk or whatever. Well, if he's a jerk, then you shouldn't submit to him. Paul said we should submit as it is fitting in the Lord. So if you have a spouse that's trying to get you to do something that's not fitting in the Lord, then you don't have to submit to that. But if you got a godly man in your life, if I was a woman, I would say, I submit. I love that. I'll lay back in the hammock and let you take care of me. I don't need to put on a uniform and get in the trenches and shoot people in the wars. I'm a woman. I belong at home. Being a woman, submitting to my wonderful, loving, believing husband. Unfortunately, a lot of marriages struggle in that area because us fellas don't always fulfill our role as the protector in the family. There won't be any marriage in the next life because there will be no death. It won't be needed. We will be living forever and ever. We will be like the angels in one way only, and that is that we won't need to procreate when we get to heaven. Now, people have asked me this question. When I get to heaven, will I still be married to my wife? Well, I guess that depends on where you go to church. Some of them out there will tell you, yeah, you're going to be married to her forever and ever and ever. And some of the husbands are going, no. And some of the wives are saying the same thing too. I don't know. I don't want to deal with this guy forever and ever. But there are groups out there that would espouse that as truth. You're going to be married for all time and eternity. Well, I don't really see that in Scripture, and I really, I can't, <laughs> I'm certain that that's not how it's going to work, but I can't really tell you today that we won't, I believe that we're going to have relationships. I believe I'm going to know you. We're going to be in heaven together, and you're going to walk up and go, hey, Tom, how you doing? It's been 30,000 years. Good to see you. <laughs> You don't look a day older, right? I think we're going to know each other. We're going to have memories. But the whole marriage thing perhaps will not be part of it. So Jesus, you know, caps off his answer in, in, in Exodus when uh, he reads, you know, the whole uh, law of the book of Moses concerning this situation. But about the resurrection of the dead, in verse 31, he says, Concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Oh, listen up, kids. This was spoken to you by your neighbor. This was spoken to you by some great theologian. This was spoken to you by rumor. No, this was spoken to you by God. When I read something like that, I think, oh, <laughs> I better pay attention to what's being said. This is God talking to me. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was spoken to you by God saying, here we go, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Pure, simple, beautiful logic. If Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were ceasing to exist, then God wouldn't be able to say, I'm the God of Abraham. Because when he says that, he means that I am presently right now the God of Abraham and Isaac 
and Jacob, which can only mean one thing. They're alive. And when the multitudes heard it, they were astonished at his teachings. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, in verse 50, it says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Now, there's a very encouraging words here. What is Paul talking about? In a flash, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall not all sleep. The word sleep is another word for die. You might remember when Lazarus died, and Jesus said, Lazarus is asleep. And they thought he was taking a nap. But he meant that he had died. So it's saying here, Paul's telling me and you that this morning, he's saying there's going to be some of us here that aren't going to die. We're just going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I don't know how fast the twinkle of an eye is, but it's pretty quick. Quicker than a blink, I'm sure of that. And one moment we're going to be here, and the next moment we're going to find ourselves in his presence. The rescue of the bride, if you will. He's referring to that in this um, in this passage that I just read to you. So, we'll pick this up again next week when, I, when we come back, in, uh, verse, starting in verse 34. Uh, we'll finish the chapter. But I just want to say this morning, um, is your hope, is your hope built upon Jesus today? Are you absolutely certain that if you walked out the door and keeled over, that you'd find yourself in the presence of God immediately? Believe me, there's no in-between. You're either a saint or you're an ain't. One or the other. What's it going to be? Well, I like the idea of being a saint, don't you? It's very comforting. It's very reassuring. It helps me remember that no matter what happens, in the end, I'm going to be with him. And that's really all that matters in the end, isn't it? Eternity is a long time, folks. And you got one shot during this life. There's no second chances. There's no do-overs. There's no coming back as a dog and trying to work your way back to being a man or a woman. No, no, you got one shot to do with your life what is going to determine your eternal destiny. So let me ask you, where are you going to be for all eternity? Are you doubting it this morning? Would you like to not have any doubt this morning? Because that can happen. But we need to allow that to happen in our lives. People don't like confessing guilt. People don't like admitting that they're sinners, that they've been living against God, that they've been running from God. It's not in our makeup to confess that but it's necessary it's the first step in gaining eternal life I see my fallen condition and there's no way for me to repair it and the only thing that can help me now is Jesus and that's the only thing I need amen, amen. if you need prayer this morning I would encourage you to get with Lonnie and Chris over here Get some prayer. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you need to dedicate it for the first time. Whatever, it doesn't matter. It's between you and the Lord. 
And so I want to inc- even while they're, come on up, you guys, even while they're up here doing the last couple of songs, if you feel like you need, want, want to get up and get some prayer, just make your way over here. You can go in the prayer room where it's nice and private. I just encourage you guys to do that this morning. Because you know, I want to bump into you in 30,000 years. I want you to be there, right? Father, thank you for your word, your truth, the simplicity, God, the logic of your word, so pure, so simple. Lord, help us to absorb that in our spirit. Help us not to complicate things, to keep it simple. Simply teaching the word simply. Help us, God, to learn, to grow, to have our foundation built upon that rock that Jesus talked about and not the sand. So that when we hear all different kinds of things coming across our path, we'll be able to discern truth from error. So thank you for your word. Give us a heart to be hungry for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>